the upper fuselage houses a number of internal details that have proved problematic to manufacture. In the main, due to the lack of any original detailed engineering or production drawings. To overcome this issue, the Whirlwind Fighter Project's Chief CAD Engineer and Designated Design Authority, Gunnar Olsen, has had to integrate all the known information from the spare schedule, Air Ministry, AP manuals, General Assembly drawings and photographic images to be able to re-engineer as far as is possible a true representation of the 3D model of the whirlwind. The process of converting the model into hard metal then requires many further hours of CAD work to turn the 3D components into 2D templates and flat components. Further work through a CAM software is then necessary to produce machining details, cutter tool paths details, then post-processor information into computer numeric code G-codes required by the CNC machine to manufacture the required components. As can be seen, this equates to many hours of work before any actual metal farming takes place. A further complication for the upper fuselage was the change in the radio fitment from the TD9 set to the VHF TR1133A set. As far as is known, no TR1133A sets exist outside of a very few examples in established air museums. The Whirlwind Fighter research has provided us with information that allows for the detailed recreation of the physical structure that contained the later TR1133A radio fit. The radio was accessible through a hinged hatch in the forward upper starboard fuselage section. The hatch door also carried an inner hinged information panel. Unfortunately we do not know what that information was. The radio set sat in a wheel trolley that ran on bearers located in the lower fuselage section. Immediately to the aft of the radio compartment a large transverse platform carried the R3003 identification friend or foe equipment and the de-icing tanks for the port and starboard propellers. An aperture to the port of the centre line provided the entry point for the main aerial lead when fitted with the TD9 set. The aperture was fitted with a rain deflector and insulator for the aerial. Images from the Whirlwind Fighter Project's archives show the aperture fittings were retained on all production aircraft even though the later VHF sets did not require the actual aerial lead. Aft of the second internal frame a further aperture to the starboard of the centre line provided the exit for the signal of the day flares. The flares were housed in the signal discharge unit mounted to a tube fitted below the aperture. The signal discharger was in some ways similar to a very large revolver pistol with six rotating chambers operated by the pilot by means of a cable push and pull handle on the instrument panel. The signal discharge unit was serviced by a circular hinge door in the starboard fuselage wall. Just above the door, on both sides, two small apertures were located. Both apertures were fitted with insulators for the aerial leads for the R3003 IFF unit, the leads extending to the outer ends of the tailplane. Please keep your eyes open for the next update video 
where we will be concentrating on the manufacture and assembly of the lower fuselage components. The Whirlwind Fighter Project is a not-for-profit charity run by a group of dedicated volunteers. If you feel you could assist in recreating this iconic World War II fighter, please visit our Facebook and web pages. Any donations can be made through the Whirlwind Fighter Project's GoFundMe page. Also, please visit our active partner in the Whirlwind Fighter Project and future home of the Whirlwind, the Kent Battle of Britain Museum at Hawkinge. Many thanks.